Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Hello, welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. I am your host, Todd McLaughlin. Today, I bring you your guest, Joe Taft. Wow, I'm not going to say a lot. What I'm going to say is you got to look him up. Go to joetaftyoga.com. Follow him on Instagram. He puts a lot of time and effort into his posts. He goes deep. And he also keeps it fun and light. So happy you're here. Remember, joetaftyoga.com. Let's begin. I'm so honored and excited to have this opportunity to meet and speak with Joe Taft. Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. Todd, thanks for having me. It's really an honor. I I, uh, got introduced to you via... Uh, Andrew Jones, and I'm. You live in Asheville, North Carolina, I believe. Am I? Am I right? I do. Yeah, I live in Asheville, and, and, and right now I'm I'm sitting and kind of looking over downtown. It's awesome. Yeah, it's beautiful. For those of you listening, if you want to have a look on our YouTube channel, you have a, a an incredible tall trees, green trees behind you. Shafts of light are coming down through the trees over your shoulder. It's very picturesque. I love Asheville. How long have you lived in Asheville? Um, I, I lived in Ash. I really moved to Asheville. Um, I bought my first house here in 2001. So uh, before I was kayaking a lot, I was a professional kayaker. So I was kind of in and out of, I traveled around a lot. And I, I bought a house here in 2001. So that was the year that I really considered myself, you know, living here, even though I was still a little bit on the road. Gotcha. So you're, you're, um, you're a professional kayaker. Well, that's, that could be a little bit of a stretch. But <laughs> I, kayak, I kayak for a living and I made money doing it. I don't know if you could call that a professional. I think not. so. <laughs> I think once you start generating income off of your passion. A you... very little income, just so you know. Uh, okay. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like the, it wasn't like going for a wall street job. It was more of a love what you do type of job. I've always done that. Yeah. I've yeah. always, um, just from, from a child early, I was always doing. Well, I'm curious. You know, doing I'm... what I love to do. So. That's cool. I'm curious, well, where did you grow up? And then what was the transition from where you grew up to the first time you got in a kayak? Yeah. So I grew up in Eastern North Carolina and I'm 51 years old now. So that was, you know, um, in the seventies. Um, and it was a very, um, is, you know, it was in the Bible belt. And so I had this opportunity to experience, um, you know, fundamentalist Christian Christianity. And uh, which I think really shaped my way uh, to become a yoga teacher um, because my family really, um, well, I'll use the word religion. They really use the word religion as the staple of life, um, the foundation of um, what's important. And so I learned that, um, you know, growing up and uh, I feel really fortunate about that. My mom was this spiritual practitioner. She, um, when she passed away, she had uh, close to a thousand people at her funeral oh, wow. um, because she was this real staple in the community. And um, and I don't I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't even realize it till probably till after she passed away seven, eight years ago that that influenced me so much. She influenced me so much through her religious practice. Yes. You know, like she was praying in the morning when I would get up and uh, things like that. So I think that really influenced me a lot to move towards uh towards practice like yoga. Oh man, I can't tell you how many, everything you've said thus far, Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to hear because Mm -hmm. the fact that you are acknowledging how important it is to have family value and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some connection of something bigger and that we, that we can potentially, uh, trust and believe Mm -hmm. in. And that also though, you, embrace a culture or all all different religious viewpoints that 
yoga may or may not present. Because I mean, do you find sometimes that maybe if we're in a, a certain element of the Bible Belt, that maybe someone might say, "Oh boy, I don't think you should be doing yoga," but you're seeing the connection between all faiths and or spirituality as being connected. I'm guessing. You know? I am. I see them all very similar. Um, although um, I had a lot of um, things I had to work through mm. by growing up in that kind of um, it was kind of a black or white mentality where there was right and there was wrong. And, and, uh, and I think that was good. Again, I think that was really good for me to experience, but now I study like non-dual Tantra Mm. and, and we don't really believe in right or wrong. We just believe in, um, there's what we like and what we don't like. Um, or, well, let me, let me rephrase that right or wrong. is not the best terminology. Let me say, um, good or bad. That's really the better terms to use. We don't really believe that things are good or bad because, um, I mean, how many times has something happened to you and you're like, oh my gosh, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And then like two months later, you're like, oh my gosh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. So true. So, so we just like things or we don't like them. Um, I definitely think there's, uh, to, to correct my first wording, I definitely think there's, um, you know, I believe in the yamas and the niyamas, you know, I believe in ethical precepts and, you know, it's best to act, um, with compassion and with truthfulness and all those things. So, um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate you, you, uh, realizing my tone, um, when I speak about that. So yeah, thanks so much. That's cool. And you said Eastern North Carolina. So I'm thinking either Outer Banks or somewhere close close to yeah yeah <laughs> not on the outer banks but about an hour from the outer banks so yeah i went to the beach a lot as a child and um so yeah that's cool and and i'm i'm 50 i i am also a 70s baby and uh-huh, I, uh-huh. I i grew up here in florida right okay. near the beach and the seven the 70s just to reminisce a little bit here mm-hmm. sure. what a what a time period you know to, to be on a bicycle and just having all this abundance of nature around and you know, parents just being like, well, just make sure you're home for dinner, you know, and, totally. and you just totally. took off and climbed trees and went to the ocean and in the rivers. And I mean, and we can still do that now and it's still all here now. So I'm not saying that that's not here, but it was just an right. amazing time. It, it really was an amazing time. I really enjoyed growing up in a that's cool, a pretty relatively small town and having woods close by and all that. Yeah. So then kayaking. When was the first kayak adventure? Yeah. So my dad would bring me up uh, to the mountains of North Carolina when I was a child and we would go down the river in a canoe, like a whitewater canoe, you know, and we'd fall out sometimes and things (laughs) like that. I felt like it was quite dangerous. And then, um, and then in that process, um, I decided to, um, when I went to college, I decided to live in Western North Carolina where we would come in the summer sometimes. So that got me like into mountain sports. Yeah. And that's when I started really cocking snow skiing. I'd already snow skied a little bit, but snow skiing, cocking. And, um, and I started traveling and, you know, really embracing, um, what I call eco sports, like eco jock sports, you know, like, um, like where you're just, gravity type sports yes. and uh, especially kayaking that was like my big one so it's phenomenal like it's like absolutely mind-blowing <laughs> to like go down a rapid and learn how to do it enough that you feel like you're dancing with the water and go off waterfalls and oh it's really oh my gosh it's just so intense but it was super hard on my body i bet like it was very very hard on my body and that's what that's ultimately what initially got me into yoga is my mm. back hurt really badly. Mm. I was like 25 years old. My back was excruciating. Like there were mornings when I couldn't get out of bed or I had to get out really slowly. And and that process kind of got me into yoga. Wow, I got to kind of warm up my hips here a little bit before I start moving. Definitely before I get in my boat because I know I'm going to hurt later. <laughs> yeah. Later in the day, I'm going to yeah. really hurt. Yeah. Not only I thought it was from the impact of always impacting really hard. But I learned la- later it was the position and just the way that my musculature was building from sitting in a boat so much. And so I started stretching, you know, I would smoke a bunch of pot and I would find a spot in the sun and I would just move my body and 
And I did that for years, not really with a teacher, just trying to figure it all out. Interesting. And, uh, and that's really what got me into yoga. Now that's cool. And so, so I, I, am, I am curious though, because I love watching kayaking. I, I've only had the experience of whitewater uh, adventures mm -hmm. in, in relation to North Carolina, just getting in an inner tube in, in Cherokee and just going, yeah, down yeah. The, going down the rivers and just having so much fun, but not to the level like what you're talking where, you know, you're in a kayak like, you know, potentially going off the edge of like a miniature waterfall or something like, you know, I don't yeah, know. totally. Yeah. Totally. What, what are some of the biggest gnarliest rivers you've had a chance to traverse? Well, there's, there's a lot of, you know, when it rains here, all these rivers fill up with water. So there's a lot of options. Yeah. Um, you know, there's quite a few that I've only done once. Um, <laughs> but there's a, a river because uh, of just, the craziness of it, because of the danger, the dangers. No, of... no, because it rains. Oh, and there's I understand. like so oh. many things to do Got and it. you just like yeah. go down one yeah. and then you're like, Oh, that was pretty cool. But you have your favorites, you know, you jump around. So, Got but it. when it's not raining, there's a dam release river near here. It's called the green river mm. and it's a Creek. It's one of those things that normally just fills up with water when you're, um, when it rains, but this one has a dam at the top. So they release it every day. Like, not every day, but frequently at like eight in the morning. So it's like you get this really incredible cool. experience of going down a super steep, like waterfalls, everything. Nice. And um, and that's probably why I ended up moving to Asheville. Because uh -huh. that creek is like always has water in it, so to speak. And so I just love that river. So that's why I moved here. That's cool. Or that's why I ended up staying here, you could say. That makes um, sense. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And was your first official yoga class where, when, and with who? Yeah, so I, um, I, since I was on the road a lot, I started figuring out that I could go to like a YMCA and take a yoga class, and I, which I'd already been doing a bunch of yoga already, right? And, um, or I mean, I called it stretching, you know, whatever, but, um, but it was quite yogic actually. Sometimes I would like candles and like get my nervous system to downregulate because I figured all that that felt better. And, um, and then, um, so I would go to just these YMCA classes. Well, once, um, I was back in Asheville and I went to a YMCA class and the teacher at the end of class was moving away. And I had been to her class like seven or eight times. She was phenomenal. She was just really powerful. And I, and I turned to her and I said, it was been, it was so nice, you know, being at your classes and I wish I could keep going. She goes, well, what you need to do is you need to go to my teacher's class. And her name is Mary Kay West. And so it was this Southern woman named Mary Kay West. And, um, and I did, I found her, she had a little cute studio down by the river area here in Asheville. And I started studying with her and she was like this little Southern woman was mm -hmm. a powerhouse <laughs> yeah. at yoga, not like power, you know, like, I mean, it was physical, but she studied all the limbs of yoga. She was a real yoga practitioner and she really turned me on to, to, to yoga as a whole spectrum practice. Nice. And then I, and I studied with her for a while and, and, uh, and she was the kind of teacher that could really take me on as a, as a, you know, as a student. And then at some point I said, I want to really learn more. And she goes, well, I'm studying a new system of yoga called Anusara. And this was in maybe 1999. And I said, what's that? She goes, well, I studied with this, you know, this system that had been, some of you might be familiar with it. it was John Friend founded it. And, um, and then once she turned me on to that, I really became a student of Anusara. And I studied Anusara for quite a few years until about 2012. I was fully certified it in 2007. And um, it was really quite powerful because my body was feeling a little better, mm. uh, a good bit better. And because um, it was an alignment based system and I had on my own, I was just studying intuitive type movement. And so I got really into, wow, if I put my body in this position, these muscles release and I feel better. And at that, at the time, that's really what I needed. Yeah. I needed somebody who understood the body really well Yes, and could, could teach me how to like, for lack of a better word, align. Right. Yes. So uh, amazing. I, I remember I was in Southern California and a friend of mine went and practiced with John friend and he came back and he was lit up with excitement. And I guess, 
in some way or shape or form, John had called him up onto the stage and had gotten him into, I think it was like where you go into Hanumanasana and you catch your back foot and go into like the, the Ekapada Raja Kapatasana uh, catch. I, I I don't know the Sanskrit name of that pose. Is What is the name of that pose? I, I don't know. Like, yeah, like, but, but something super deep that he was like not even and yeah. <laughs> yeah not even ready for at all right, right. And, and wasn't didn't get injured and he was just like i don't know how i got into that position and how he got me into it and i was he was like i was blown away he was just so on fire from the mm. experience would you did you ever have any of those sort of moments oh many many yeah many of those moments yeah, yeah. cool that was kind of his gift but that was um, like really infusing a whole classroom or an individual, which kind of infused the whole classroom with Shakti. Did you feel um, he had a certain a special mojo with the yoga that, that, that that's across the board. The people that study with him had that similar sort of admiration for him. Yeah, it was a real, it was a real, um, it was a real Shakti awakening type of experience. Gotcha. And, um, and I love that. I mean, yeah. I was a adrenaline addict at the time. <laughs> yeah. I'd, been, I'd been running big waterfalls and, <laughs> um, and I was kind of finding, which, I mean, I look back at that now and I was like, probably not the best idea to trade in a sense, an addiction for an addiction in yoga. Um, but that's, but that's what drew me His charismatic personality. Um, you know, feeling just so much Shakti in my body, so much prana alive. That's what he, he brought, I mean, sometimes I went to sleep for days after the workshops and I, that was, um, I was young, I was young enough that I was okay. And, um, but yeah, it was really, really powerful to be around a teacher like that. How did, and, uh, how did yeah. the fallout around John Friend affect you? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have an online program called nativeyogaonline.com and there's a code, all caps, first month free. Uh, we upload our daily classes that we teach here at Native Yoga Center, making it accessible for you no matter where you are in the world at any time of the day and or night that you want to practice. We're here for you. All right. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Let's get back into it. Yeah, and so then the fallout ha fallout happened. He started kind of acting outside of the um, domain of what you might call ethical, and um, and that was like a really big deal. You know, some of the top teachers started kind of dropping off, and then people started asking questions, and and um, so and I kind of stuck with it for a little while. I really wanted to, and I even called him and we chatted and he's like, yeah, I made some mistakes and he seemed really humble. And so I kind of hung around for a while, but then his actions weren't really aligning with, um, with what, what he'd even said to me on the phone. So, um, so the fallout was a really big deal for a lot of people. And for me, the, the biggest part of the fallout was, um, that I had a global community. You know, I could go somewhere and study yoga, like New York City, for example. I could go there and there'd be like 200 people there and I wouldn't know like 100 of them. And some of them would be from Australia or wherever. So I had this really big global community, which I, I, I feel was very powerful. And then I had these teaching principles that I taught from and and all that kind of shattered. So I had to rediscover myself as a yoga teacher. Yes. And, and I did. And I, I went in and I got into, uh, I, I studied different things. I studied Pilates for a while. I studied, um, I studied weight training because I'm really skinny. I'm really flexible and really skinny. So I studied weight training. This was really good for me. Um, and I studied some other methods of yoga before I had to study like Ashtanga and so many other things. But, um, but yeah, I got to kind of branch out uh, in a sense. And that that's, was a really powerful time for me. That's so cool. Really, really that, powerful time for me. That's cool that now with a little bit of time to be able to look back and the way you said initially in our conversation about seeing things that might seem bad now, you look back and you go, that actually was really good. And it's, it's neat to hear how you've had enough time to process all that and the growth process that occurred because of what seemed tragic 
and now you're in a better place for it. It sounds like. Oh yeah. I mean, to, to take, um, you know, I don't really believe that with my upbringing or, or uh, Americans, I don't think like we work well with the kind of the guru model, but I'm really fortunate that I got to actually experience that. I'm um, like, I know what that feels like. Um, on a really, I feel like a very authentic level. I know what that feels like. And, um, and again, I don't, I don't think it really works in our society the way we were brought up, uh, or at least I'll speak. Let me say, I, I don't feel like it works for me in the way that I was brought up. And so, but I did get to experience it and it was like, so cool, you know, because you learn so much when you, when you trust, I had a few teachers really that I trusted this way, but I trusted so much that I learned so fast. Uh, and I would not undo that, although I had to undo a lot of the things that I did learn. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that was suffering. Unlearning something that's really deep in your system <sighs> is, 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 <sighs> is, I mean, to me, it's like the definition of suffering. Well said. Um, so, so, but I'm really happy that um, I went through that. Yeah. That's... I learned about Shakti too. You know, I, I really have a really intimate relationship because I learned Tantra there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where I really learned Tantra, not only from him, but I learned from Douglas Brooks, uh, Carlos Pomida, Sally Kempton. These are all people he's encouraged us to study with. Bill Mahoney. I mean, these guys are badasses. <laughs> and and I had and I dove deep into that. And so I really learned the philosophy of Tantra there. And that stuck with me, man, that back to me growing up in a religious environment. I'm all of a sudden learning a system that's the opposite of what I learned growing up on some level, but the guts were really the same, you know, mm. let go of some, let go of your individuality and trust in something greater than yourself. I mean, come on, like to really, like I grew up like kind of having to believe that, but now I was all in such a, in a situation where I was like feeling in my body. Like I was honoring like the way that the, the energy in my body was pulsing and i could sense that i was like oh my gosh this is like not something i have to like believe in this is something i can like i can feel the pulse of it and there's an order to it i can like play with it you know when my pelvis is heavy and my spine is lifted my heart tends to open and i am like more open to the to the celebration of life you know so i'm so grateful just so mm. grateful for the whole journey, you know. Man, you communicated that really well. Mm, I, I thank can you. I sense that. Nice yeah. job. Do you, so, so, yeah, please. So, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, because I don't really know your yoga that well. <laughs> so um, please. I know you. You know Andrew. Like, can you tell me just a little bit, and that might help deepen our conversation. Yeah. So I can speak to, um, oh. what is your background and I, I, maybe your listeners know so you can give me a shorter answer or a longer answer whichever you think oh. is appropriate for your podcast for your podcast stuff so uh thank you uh, i'll try mm -hmm. to keep it short but things that i feel like we have in common i grew up surfing and i uh, i mm -hmm. uh traveled the world and got a chance to surf uh incredible mm -hmm. places so i can also attest to the thrill of gravity dropping down into a situation where you have split second time to make a move that will determine your reality with either suffering or <laughs> or su or some sukkah some sweetness you know a, yeah yeah a, a split moment right like big you know big heavy barreling waves and so i love that that's why I, i'm not a big kayaker but i i, I feel you on that same, same um, and, thing. And that played a big part in my discovery of yoga. I was, I, I had moved back to Florida and Florida is not known for its, you know, barreling incredible reef break waves. And so I started practicing Bikram yoga. Um, mm. initially when I, when I, um, when I was 18, I got introduced to, uh, Krishna consciousness and I started hanging out with mm. Hare Krishna devotees. So I initially, mm. Chanting Hare Krishna mantra was my initial yoga practice, but then I started doing Bikram and like the intensity of the heat and the challenge of it and being able to be physical and feel that energy in a room without needing to worry about the conditions, the wind, the sun, the, I just was like, this is it. You know, I, I can feel surfing in my body anywhere, anytime. So I feel like I, got so hooked on it, started practicing massage therapy as well and really falling in love with anatomy. And then just from there, I've just kind of, I keep 
studying and and seeking and practicing. Uh, my wife and I have had our yoga studio here in Juneau Beach for the last 18 years together. And then we had uh, co-owned a Bikram studio in San Diego for f- uh, three and a half years prior to that. So we've been teaching uh, together for 20 something years. And so um, we did go to India and study with Patabi Joyce. Uh, I kind of like had, there was a big fallout with the Bikram world. And, and mm-hmm. uh, prior to all that, I thought, well, let me go to India and study with Patabi Joyce. And then there was a big fallout in that world. So I've had multiple fallout situations too. Mm-hmm. And I can say that I've grown so much and learned so much from that as well, even though at the moment it felt like a dark night of the soul type of um, questioning, you know. So, yeah. um now currently, and I can also attest to back pain, uh, I'm relearning everything all over again due to some degenerative disc stuff. And I'm really in love with it again, you know, and I've had so many ups and downs over the years of just being absolutely infatuated and then having questions of like, what, what have I done to myself and what am I doing to myself? (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so, um, I'm completely enthralled with, what yoga brings and, and, and how it just has been such an incredible tool for my own personal self-discovery. And, um, it's just, it's still going. And I, and I'm just, uh, uh, last night we, we got a group together. We're right near the beach. We went down and watched the full moon. It was the flower moon and had such a incredible community experience last night that I was driving home going, I don't think life could get any better. I don't think it could. I think, I think this is it. I don't, I'm not. Wow. Yeah. So I, I really, yeah, I'm in a good place right now, thankfully, <laughs> but it, I, I've been doing this podcast for four years. Listeners, you probably have heard me, you know, complain a lot too over the years, but right now this is a, I'm in a good place. Thank you for asking. Did, what did yeah, that, what course. did that, what kind of thoughts did that prompt for you? Yeah. I love that we have this similar background <laughs> of, um, really, uh, a, um, an embrace of life from an early age, I think. A real, I mean, if you're traveling around surfing, you're really like, you're really, you're really a seeker when you're, you know, if you were kind of traveling the way I am, you're, you're kind of seeking. Yes. You're like seeking, hundred uh, percent a high, I think on some level. True. And, and, uh, and then, and to, to, to get into yoga, which, especially as we age, um, is a way to like embrace that high, um, but, but make it a connection to something greater than yourself because otherwise it's just going to burn out. You're going to burn out in anything that you do. Um, it's a great if you point. don't make great. the connection to something higher. I agree. I yeah. agree. I agree. You know, so, I, yeah, I love, love our parallels. Thank you. I know. I'm so excited. This is amazing. I, you had made mention prior to us hitting the record button that you're offering a mythology course. So I'm curious, what myths have you and or do you currently draw from and see parallels with your own life and what the myth, what that myth tells? Yeah. So I, um, so just to back up a little bit, I'm, I, I believe in, I believe in mythology. I think it's a, you know, similar to like a yoga text. I just for simplicity's sake, I categorize a myth very similar to a, a, a yoga text. It's packed. It's packed with knowledge. It's packed with teachings. I like to think of a, a yoga text like a sutra or a mythological story as a zip file. They're kind of going extinct, but you know, like you, 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 op- you double click on the zip file and it opens up and it's like thousands of documents. You know, so that's kind of how I see um, a yoga text, and I also see mythology that way. Um, the piece that I love about the mythology is that I see mythology as your dr- our dream world, which is our unconscious, like our dreams kind of come up from our unconscious, and mythology is telling the story of our unconsciousness and bringing it up. And I mean, what happens in the mythology, you know, Hanuman like tears his heart open. Um, and that's kind of like something that happens in your dream. Like you're, you have these intense experiences of like ripping your heart open. And, and you can do that like in a yoga practice, like you can take your attention like into your heart and you can almost like connect the conscious mind with the subconscious mind because you were told a story and maybe even felt that story in your body. 
we sometimes call that an awakening when you're not thinking, but you really sense the story. The story starts to leave, but you start to feel like you're in a dream state in your body and you open your heart, for example, which is really like not a good idea if you don't have a skill set called yoga, right? If you don't have a tool set to handle that opening, but if you're studying yoga, you have that sk skill set. You know what it's like to like really fall deeply in love with nature or deeply in love with another human being. And you're completely okay with it because, because I mean, falling in love is like so scary. I mean, whether it's another person or it's like even in love with your meal can be like super scary if you're open on that level. But you have the skill set of yoga to be able to like live life that fully. Um, that to me is mythology. So like, get that subconscious to come out so you're you're not living in the dark so to speak you're like bringing all of yourself to the experience of life well said thank you amazing and so you're a big fan of joseph campbell yeah i'm a big joseph campbell, <laughs> campbell fan. yeah i love the guy love what joseph a, a, campbell yeah, yes. his great. books are incredible i mean that mm -hmm. when i first came uh Hero is it Hero with a Thousand Faces? Mm. That one's yeah, I never read that one, but yeah, absolutely amazing. His is it uh, Bakshish and Brahman? Did you read that one? That was incredible. Of his journeys through India. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, he is so deep. So yeah, then, incredible. Which, um, if we were to draw from a a philosophy rooted in India, what one? And I love that you brought up Hanuman because the Ramayana has mm -hmm. so many beautiful stories and I love the element of how devoted Hanuman is and this this uh perfection of devotee and 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 I also love the story of uh you know Hanuman has been cursed and and can't remember he can do anything and the idea I love of like that part chanting he doesn't remember his power until he he's rem reminded until he's reminded which I feel like is a reminder to us that we often doubt ourselves and and that potentially we can remind ourselves that we we can achieve probably a lot more than than we really believe we can. Totally. What 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 myths what are speaking to you these days? Well, um, I I'm about to teach a six week series, so it's like this. Um, I've been doing for about twenty years. I've been teaching these six week series where people take six classes in a row, so the information can build. Because I find that to be much more powerful than, um, you know, you've probably figured out when we teach a public yoga class, there could be new people there. And um, and the classes here can be quite big. So um, there could be four or five new people that I've never met in class. So I have to kind of start over every time. But over a series, I get to kind of unpack um, unpack something. And my next six-week series is, is the gods of yoga. And... Um, Hanuman, Ganesha, Shiva, um, because the last six week series I taught was on the goddesses. Mm. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of goddess worship. Um, and the way that I like to define that is that, um, is that everything in this world has like a flavor, a sense. Everything has like a flavor. It has like a flavor that we like. It's like blooming and blossoming and it's, and we're just like drawn to that blooming or and blossoming. And we, we might call that Lakshmi. And because that's what Lakshmi represents, like the full manifestation of beauty in its climatic form. And then you have, um, for example, times in your life where you're like, oh my God, this was really tough. You know, my community's been torn apart or I've lost a teacher or my yoga practice is, is drying up now or something. And that those challenging times could be called Durga. Like Durga is the, the one who, um, who you step into for the power to be like rejuvenated and reborn, so to speak, and uh, to fight the battle of um, getting pulled into the internet. <laughs> you know like the internet you know like i'm oh my god i'm like spending too much time on the internet i need durga you know i like how i like i just uh, i just read this thing by prince the other day and it says he goes he goes computer's cool it's cool to get on the computer but don't let the computer get on you 
Oh yeah. You know, it's cool. It's cool to use the computer. Just don't let the computer use you. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so that would be like Durga when you're feeling like you're like getting overwhelmed with, mm. um, I'm a 12 stepper. So I have a, 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 a background of addiction. And so, um, so I have to invoke this goddess energy called Durga. And then, and then you have like, like you're in your really deep, dark times of your life when you're unsure and you can't see where you're going and you feel like you're just completely broken down. We call that Kali, right? It's the goddess, she's the, the, the dark one. She's, uh, she's the one that's like your compost rot- rotting in your backyard, <laughs> you know? And she's the, she's you lying in bed at night going, I don't know if I can actually deal with my next, uh, what I have going on in my life right now, I'm completely torn down. She's like the hag, you know, um, and, and you are that at times. You are all these energies. And so I'm a big fan of, of goddess study, of nice. goddess worship. That's a great explanation. Yeah. Thank and you we for study. Yeah. And we, and we honor all the goddesses, you know, in a sense, we honor all the parts of ourselves in this, in this tradition. Um, so amazing yeah, thanks for listening. amazing how do you reconcile your childhood upbringing under monotheism with a passion and a love for am i wrong in saying polytheism no, that's, that's appropriate okay. I think that's at least some depends on how mm-hmm. you know i have my mm-hmm. hands like drawing mm-hmm. away from one another if you're mm-hmm. just listening mm-hmm. like how far on either side of the spectrum of those two things and yeah and the way that I grew up and the way that I study now are quite different, but in some ways they're really the same. Mm. I just think they're just that one They're like, if you know, in this tradition we call Shiva that, which is like holds everything. Um, and then Shakti is that which is turning and changing Shiva on one end is like the stillness of, uh, the stillness of, um, a still mind, you know, a, a room, an empty room that nobody's in there, but you walk into the room and you can sense the stillness and your mind is calm. And there's like, you're so present. There's like no thinking that in this tradition, in my tradition, or the way at, le- at least I think about it, that would be Shiva and Shakti would be the turning and the churning and all the changes and all the, 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 the cycles of nature. And, and, um, and so the Christianity was just way more towards the Shiva side. Yes. There's this one force that is um, in their tradition governing everything, and you just have to align with that. You know, you are a sinner in a sense, and you just have to, which is cool. I mean, they're just saying, hey, surrender first. You're such a sinner that you just have to surrender, just like the addicts. They have the, the, all the addicts say, You're, I'm an addict. I realize I'm totally screwed up. And I have to recognize that before I can like move towards Shiva, you know, move towards the stillness. So I have no problem with all the other systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I definitely am geared towards the other side of things of, of the Shakti side, which is uh, the highs and the lows and the good and the bad. And I'm okay with all that now. That's cool. I'm curious, like I'm just going to paint a scenario and just, I'm curious how, you navigate this potential scenario. You go for a holiday uh, meal with a family, an extended mm-hmm. family member, and the extended family mm-hmm. member um, starts to, um, you know, question you about your current outlook on life, and and we'll just say that they are their outlook is of one idea and yours is here and, and you're seeing that they're one in the same and there's a spectrum. How do you uh, strategize your responses and or your um, way of being authentic to who you are and what you feel, but not engaging in a way that would cause the other person to feel like you're argumentative with them? Does that make sense? Was that a little too very, abstract that was, or does that? that... Was, no, that was very clear. Okay. And such a real life situation. I love that. I thought it was perfectly stated. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so I try to find the similarities first. Good one. Um, 
like back up, like big picture first. Yeah. Step away back and just see if we can find some similarities. And then, um, and a lot of times you don't actually get a chance to talk about your differences. Um, in that, I just have to be okay with that. Um, so all the ways in which, you know, we have a similar view. I think all people want to appreciate the gift of life and to appreciate maybe their belief system. And I think it's so great that people have belief systems. And so if, if I believe there's only one thing, cause I'm a non-dualist, I believe all the things that they have are for the big picture, at least all the things that they think about and believe in are part of the one. So I just try to find that oneness first. Nice. And <clears> usually that's, really all that it leads to. Yeah. But if there's a deeper conversation, I'm also okay with an argument. Um, if they want to, if they want to engage in a little deeper conversation mm -hmm. where there is some tension, then I think that's a really healthy part of life. Um, then, you know, I'll call that Durga has come to the table or whatever. <laughs> yeah. that's, the situation, that's what right? I was thinking. I saw compost <laughs> right when he said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> so, so, um, I do train, my tendency is to stay on the positive side with family members or maybe like a yoga practitioner. I'm, I'm okay with having a deeper dialogue because I know it will, you know, scab up over time, but a family member, I usually just stay with the similarities and anytime it gets to be a deeper conversation and we start to find our differences. And if there's tension in that differences, I try to keep coming back to the similarities. And so it stays, um, stays, Family like it says we feel we mm. stay we feel like we stay family the whole time. Nice because I mean, have you ever argued with someone and gotten your point across really clearly, but it only pushed them the other direction? Yeah, they can't even hear you. They can't even hear you till you're on the same side. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's the problem with politics now. Everybody's like, yeah. their, their statements, in my opinion, are statements that push the other side away. Yeah, and I mean, I don't expect them to be able to to to. I don't expect a politician to be able to, um, you know, find the big picture between people because that's not their gift. But I think us as pra yoga practitioners, we have the, we have the, I mean, we have the ability, a yoga teacher is basically somebody who's hopefully gotten clear enough with their philosophy and clear enough with their words that they can communicate in a way that there's a connection first. Again, because nobody will, nobody will hear, the other side won't hear, or the other two sides won't hear each other unless it's from connection. Great point. How does a non-dualist and or how do you view the turmoil in the global picture? Like if we watch the news, we could potentially tune into a story that seems fairly scary like um threatening and all sorts of kind of heaviness i i'm curious when you see that does it affect you or are you able to kind of see the durga in it the uh, are, are you are you saying are you saying that seeing like in a certain situation this challenging or are you saying like the big the great unraveling we're experiencing yeah now? i think i feel yeah yeah i mean I, if i if i turn on and i see a war over here and a war over there and oh a, i see and a, um like a lot of turmoil like a lot of a lot of differencing of opinion a lot of um i guess i, I i'm enjoying the way that well when you said the shiva and the shakti and the balance of the duality of the, the stillness with the churning. Mm -hmm. And then like you're saying, the ability to <clears throat> recognize the, the Kali, the destruction, the, the real, our darker side, our, our heavier side, and then maybe not to use the word darker, but just our, our, That's fair. Um, yeah, Dark is good, you yeah. know, it, but then somehow appreciating like that ability to actually appreciate it. So I guess on some level I could look at all these, tumultuous scenarios in the world and see that it, it is somehow is serving a, a higher purpose or a greater purpose. Like it's, it's, it's actually okay, even though it's so hard to stomach. Is that it's so hard? It's so hard to stomach. 
It really is it's hard um, to stomach, isn't it? I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I know really it's not just is. me. I know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I would love to hear your answer also because okay. um, obviously you're so steeped. Um, but yeah, I think um, it is hard to stomach, and. Um, you know, I just believe that consciousness is expanding. That's that's the nature of it. Mm. And I believe that it expands in a way that it can get an, a, an experience of itself. Oh, and a lot cool. of times that experience that's... of itself is through really intense experiences like destruction. And um, the destruction and, is a is an example is almost an example of expansiveness like a, that's right. Absolutely. That even though wanna, it's still expanding, even though it might appear to be a, an an involution or a a closing in or like a an in like yeah, I see. All right. Yeah. So we're we're you know, I mean I mean, you know, the, the foundation of the philosophy that I study is consciousness wants to just experience itself. And um And the intensity of life, you know, gives such a mirror. I mean, how many times do we turn on a movie and it's dramatic? We want to, we want to get a reflection of ourselves. That's not because mm. that's because who we are. That doesn't have anything to do with us as individuals. That's because it's the, that's the, in the DNA of consciousness herself. Oh, cool. So, yeah. so, I mean, we're just acting out consciousness's journey. Now we can steer it. We can steer it some, which is cool. So now we're talking about the practice of yoga on some level. We can start to we can start to organize the prana and organize the consciousness in a way that it turns back and gets a clear image of Shiva, the stillness. And in that process, um, we're not controlling. We're just co-participating in a way that maybe we don't participate so much in in the destruction. Now, are we? Yeah, of course. We're all we're all participating in the destruction because it's. It's the journey we're on right now as a civilization. But I think we can, it feels good to not participate as much because mm -hmm. we have, we have say so over it. Hopefully, because the, the, the journey in this unraveling of consciousness is for us to really see the truth. Truth is kind of the foundation, in my opinion, of the practice. So in the journey of trying to be conscious or to, to see nature in its truest form, we have more say so over how our own consciousness or how consciousness unravels inside of us. And so this is, this is, you know, our work. Um, we do, we do have some say, so we can choose that life is a blessing beyond deeper than our recognition. It is, and that's my approach. And we mm -hmm. can also recognize that it is the most intense suffering that anybody could ever imagine. Um, so we do have enough say, so in this unraveling of consciousness that we can make that choice. And I choose the, the former. I like I choose it. that life is this yeah. Yeah. delicate, delicate experience that we should celebrate fully. Matter of fact, I think about it. If we celebrate it more fully, we're going to actually just have less. We're going to create less destruction. Yeah, I think I you're mean, right. we can we can create it in a way that there we can we can celebrate in a way there is this destruction, and we are doing that. But um, <laughs> but that yeah. is that is my message. I mean, my message is my mission statement in my yoga classes is let's come together and and through the process of consciousness unraveling, let's celebrate life as much as possible. Nice. Yeah. You, you made mention of, I like the word that you used to describe the goddesses with flavor. That was cool. You're going to give a course on the gods. Is yep. there a juxtaposition to flavor that is a balance point from the feminine and the masculine? Well, in my, in my opinion, uh, a god like Hanuman is, in a sense, really a goddess. In this conversation, if Shiva is contracting and going into the still place, then anything we can really talk about mm. and anything that moves and, and we have to tell stories about it, mm. it's it's actually really a goddess. Oh, that's cool. Context. I've never so, thought so of that. So Hanuman before. would be <laughs> yeah. really a goddess, in a sense, because it's he's changing. He's <sighs> their story like so. So goddess in, in, in my, in my opinion, is anything that is moving towards the cycle and changing and mother nature's evolving, changing nature of things and moving towards the, 
masculine and is is moving towards stillness and calm and quiet. So the 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 universal. So so to me, anything where I'm talking about mythology is really talking about the goddess, even if it's a god. If that makes any sense. It does. It almost yeah. makes sense because if you're talking, you're acting, which is movement, which would be goddess. That's right. If you were to not talk, then you would be moving toward the stillness. And you're, therefore, you're completely on top of it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You're helping me. I mean, you're, how, you're steering how, it perfectly. How do you talk about? <laughs> what, say that again. You, you're helping me. You're steering it perfectly to uh, <laughs> to understand this, and I and I love this. I, I mean, I'm so fascinated by non dual philosophy. The more I meet people that are avidly engaging in this discourse, I'm 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 just always in awe. I just mm-hmm. uh, and I. It's incredible. Uh, so, but I, what, what, I, I, what please. philosophy are you steeped in? Ooh, um, I guess my first thing that pops to mind is I, I, I want, I'll, I'll talk about a book that I'm currently reading. Yes, I have not, yes. I have not finished it all the way, but I'm gleaming a lot of uh, insight, and it's called "The Case for God" by Karen hmm. Armstrong, hmm. and she was a nun. She went down an atheist path and now she's more in the middle and seeing all of it is co cohabit we can all cohabitate. <laughs> and Excellent. she she gives a bird's eye historical view of homo homo sapiens uh history of religion around the world. Start going going even pre well, shamanic to um, Vedic Upanishad. Mm, interesting. Christianity interesting. or Judaism, Christianity, yeah. Islam, Sufism, and mm-hmm. and just very well researched, very academic, but mm. fascinating. So I guess interesting. Interesting. I guess I'm just my philosophy is to just keep listening and and just keep asking questions. And, and I love Socrates. I love the Greek philosophy. I love the Hindu mythology and philosophy. Um, but I'm also, I grew up Catholic and I had a real turning of my back from all of that when I started going toward the East. Same, and I'm yeah. interested in, I'm just starting to have this reconnection again where I'm like, I want to, I want to know about all of it. I want to, I want to accept and love all of it. Like I, I, I want to embrace all the prophets and, and all of the the sinners and all, you know, like mm-hmm. just so, and I think that aligns well with non-dual philosophy. The more I traverse mm-hmm. that non-dual approach and I, but I, I feel like I've just reconnected with it a little bit when you said, consciousness wants to expand. And, and so I, I don't know, I just, it just, that makes perfect sense to me. It seems mm-hmm. to explain a way of helps me to make sense of what I'm seeing in, in my, mm-hmm. in my local environment and then my global and my global perspective. Mm-hmm. But so thank you mm-hmm. for asking. I'm curious what other, what other, um, you made a couple mentions of Shiva and the stillness can you give us another gentle tour of other gods and not? I think I would like to talk about just for a moment, since we're getting close to the end of our time, please. I'd I'd like to talk about like the importance of practices like breath work and prana, prana work and movement and exercise. And (laughs) yes, please. Because I think like in a, in a, in a philosophy, I think in any philosophy or any, any life, but just in the context of our conversation to, to be able to kind of do what we're doing right now and have a deeper conversation um, or to embrace a non-dual like tantric philosophy, which is quite dangerous um, because you're not, um, you know, you're not trusting in anything that's like human-like in a sense. And, um, and you're not really saying, Hey, well, that's bad. I'm never going to do that. Or, and you have to be very, very careful. So now we're talking about like, where's the prana in your body? Is your pelvis settled? Like right now, I'm so jazzed from the conversation. My pelvis is like a little lifted right now. You know what I mean? It's like such a great conversation. Like yeah. we have this great little shakti thing going on, you know? Um, 
but um you know if we're not doing like physical practices and like integrating mm. like mm. i'm gonna have to get off the phone i might have to like do a couple movements and mm. you know breathe into my my belly and and ground out because like things can get away from us um so i i want to just bring it back to that i am a movement teacher i really believe in you know sitting in meditation and and um making sure that my the energy of my legs is down for the majority of the time when i'm standing and sitting that my legs belong down to the earth and my spine lifts up and that um when that gets mixed up you know when my system gets mixed up that um we're all doing the the skills you know we have the skills to um bring balance and make the system harmonious mm, um great so point. we can we can like be rooted in a in some kind of philosophy that's open-minded i mean what do you think i mean on some level closed-mindedness is that the human body is not balanced enough that you know we have to believe in something so we get our balance from that we have to like believe in this thing that's other than us um so i think really being in the body and being able to come into a place of equilibrium equilibrium and integrate the hard experiences into our system that's really supports this kind of conversation that we're having i mean i know you know all this but i just think it's important for listeners to to like have it said i think you're right i'm really glad you did that because i was starting to get a little out there and i and i think um you're right right when you said that where is my breath what is my energy doing right now so true and i and i like do you remember when you were practicing and at some point somebody said oh that yoga they're doing it's just it's just western exercise and it's not mm-hmm. yoga it's not yoga it's like you're mm-hmm. it's just asana based and it's not real yoga so i love that you're bringing it back to the, how important <laughs> The, the practices of observing body, posture, breath, nervous system function. Absolutely right. Thank you. That was good. Yeah. Nice little, yeah. nice little turn there. Thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's for me, it's really important for me because I'm really skinny and really a Vata type. So I've had the blessing throughout my life of being able to um, have to really stay in, stay kind of balanced in a sense. Yeah. Good one. My body, yeah. Man, Joe, you know, it's really, I, I absolutely, one of my most favorite things to do is, is to do this, to podcast and, and, and mm. talk knowing that like we, you and I are talking, but in the back of the mind, knowing that possibly somebody else is listening and then you obviously are listening so that it, and then meeting when I met Andrew and then I trust Andrew I had a great, I, I really appreciate his vibe. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Him and Pam are awesome. Love that guy. And then, and, to, Pam, yeah. and then to say, Andrew, can you introduce me to some people? And then to have him introduce me to you and then boom, right away, we can just jump right in and have all this common thread going on. That's a good point. That's I mean, a good point. We did just drop right <laughs> in. I love that. <laughs> and I, I think um, there's something just so freaking cool about it. I, I just love it. I'm so thankful. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. I know doing this earlier time for you was a little more challenging. So thank you for bending on that one. And, um, is there anything, you know, I want like, I, I want to respect your, I do respect your time and we both have a busy schedule. Okay. How can we conclude? What would be a good conclusion? Um, I, mean, we, we could I would go, like yeah. to, I would like to say, um, I think one thing is that um, I'm on Instagram. I don't do it a lot. I'm very minimum, but I give my theme each week. I, I skip some weeks, but I give my theme. And there, um, so if you're interested in like hearing like a brief synapse of what my class is, um, I put a lot of effort into those posts. So um, you could follow that. And I also have the six week series coming up, which is online or in person. Um, so uh, oh, the, actually, forget that will be over. But um, <laughs> the the uh, but yeah, off, just but, but offered, I, I would love to stay in touch. But offer it again. Yeah. Off, but it, yeah, you know, I do. I offer it, it all it, the time. It's all rolling over. It'll be different material, but I'm always offering things. So I'd love to have people, um, you know, study with me, basically. And and then the other thing I'd like to say is, 
just how much I enjoyed being here. I really appreciated this conversation and and uh, I felt like I felt like I made a friend, which Thank is you, super cool. I really value intimacy. So um, I felt like just the way you hold space allowed me to to just really be open and and get to get to know you. So Thank um, you, Joe. a little Thank bit. You. So hopefully we can have a, another conversation where I get to hear you speak a little bit more. So. Let's do that. Let's do that. And and I uh, remind me your IG handle, your Instagram name. It's it's just Joe underscore Taft underscore Yoga. Perfect. Yeah. I am following you over there, and I'm going to make a, a more of a point to um, comment, read, meditate. And next time I come through Asheville, because I have family close by to you guys in Greenville, Tennessee, uh, I'm going to try to, I already was trying to convince my wife when we come up uh, this summer, I was like, Tamara, is there any way I can just like take a day trip over to Asheville and, <laughs> and go practice yoga with all these cool people I'm meeting? Oh, please, yeah. so please I, come. I would love to have you. That would be cool, man. And maybe that you could introduce me, me so to, happy. to kayaking, river kayaking. Yeah. That would be incredible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or just get out on a hike, just a quick yeah. hike. That would be awesome. um, We can hike within a minute drive from downtown. We can hike. So nice, man. Um, Well, I I appreciate it. I do find made a friend as well. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our future conversation. And I wish you and your family lots of health and happiness. Great. Same to you, Todd. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Awesome. We'll talk to you later. Thank you so much. Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time.